prepaid call from Susan Monica Coffee. An adult. This call will be recorded and subject to monitor. Yeah, hello, Susan. How are you doing? Hi, Taylor. Oh, I'm doing pretty Thanks for, uh, good. Good, Thanks for taking the time to, uh, so Susan, I want to I want to start out having you introduce yourself to Taylor. Talk a little bit about what you're in prison for, or from your point of view, and then we can get into it. Uh, well, what I'm in prison for is two murders. What I'm guilty of is stupidity. Oh gosh. Um, well, this whole thing started. 40 years ago, I guess. Um, Stephen Delafino had a brain tumor and had epilepsy. He had brain surgery three to remove the tumor. And according to his brother, that left him not the same and that he did things that were not in his normal character after the surgery. About 20 years ago, I met Steve at the residence of George and, and Beverly Guerrero. Uh, she was a Seventh-day Adventist. And uh, they had uh, some property about five miles up the road from me. And uh, Steve lived in a little uh, Airstream trailer. Uh, and uh, he did little odd jobs, mostly just uh, mowing the grass and little, little things like that and the exchange for a place to live in that little trailer. George died and uh, Beverly buried George in her vegetable garden. This was where I learned that you could bury people in, uh, on your own property. Unfortunately, I did not uh, ask about, you know, do we need to get a permit? Uh, totally, that's why I say totally stupid on my part. After George died, Steve started stealing from people up and down the road. And uh, like I say, he was, he was slow mentally and he didn't understand a lot of things. He didn't understand that you could sell something that was worth $500 for $100. All he ever wanted to do was get enough money to buy a case of beer. He was a, a really nice guy. He was very much a gentleman all the time. He would open the doors for me and always wanted to carry things for me. Just a really nice guy. But uh, after George died, Beverly would not buy him any beer. He was always drinking nearly a case of beer every day. One day he took a rifle from me that was worth about $300. And uh, when I noticed it was gone, I went out to a um, pawn shop and I bought two more rifles. I was hoping that if he needed beer money again, he would take them and not, uh, uh, as being a contractor, I didn't want him taking my, the tools that I needed for work all the time. And then uh, one day he decided he was going to uh, go to Florida where he had a house. And uh, this made no sense to me because he had been living in a little Airstream trailer for over 10 years that I knew him. And I, you know, this was just irrational as far as I was thinking that he would be living in a little trailer and have a house in Florida. He went ahead and he asked me for $100. And uh, well, he, he, he called me and said uh, that he was, uh, he was leaving. And I had tried several times to get him to to stay where he was or move in with me. And then uh, he called me and wanted me to pick him up. So I picked him up, he was walking down the road, nothing but the clothes on his back. In the car he said he wanted $100 and he was gonna go to Florida. And uh, I tried to talk him out of it a couple more times. I gave him the $100 and then uh, my next stupid mistake was that I asked him where he, uh, or, or I should say who uh, he sold the rifle to that I had. He went nuts. He thought I was going to have him arrested for stealing. I didn't know it at the time, but he had hit me so hard with the butt of a rifle that he busted my right breast implant. Oof. I was just really, really sore. 
couldn't stand the pain much longer. I kept yelling at him to stop hitting me, and um, he just would stop. Stop. Finally, I had this little uh, uh, derringer, and uh, I took the little derringer and I I fired it. I said, uh, Steve, stop hitting me, you know, and uh, or else I'm gonna I'm gonna shoot you. I went ahead and I shot again, and I missed. I got. I was trying to shoot him in the upper arm. He pushed me really hard into the plumbing on my shower. I shot at the same time that he had pushed me back, and I accidentally shot him in the head. But all I did was make a matter at the the autopsy. When they did the autopsy, they found the uh, the bullet just in his scalp. All it did was make it bleed, make him bleed a lot. When I did that, then he started yelling, "I'm going to kill you." And I managed to get away for a couple minutes. And he chased me into another room in the, in the barn. And we were fighting some more. I went ahead and I threw the little pistol, a uh, little derringer, I threw that away. And I managed to get, the, uh, get a hold of the rifle that he was beating me with. And then he kind of kneeled down to uh, grab my leg. While he was grabbing my leg, I managed to turn the rifle around it. I was holding on to the two by four that was in the uh, in the room that we were in, in where I had the uh, some pens for the for the pigs to be birthing in. While I was holding on to the two by four to keep from keep him from getting me down to the ground, I went ahead and I took the rifle and I, I shot him. He went ahead and he grabbed me even harder. And I put the, I mean, I was, I was holding the rifle with my left hand and shooting at him. And I, uh, I thought I had missed. So I was yelling at him to uh, let go and whatnot. And uh, when he didn't let go, I went ahead and I shot him a couple more times. I couldn't believe it, but he was still holding on to my leg really tight. And I didn't know it at the time, but I'm pretty smart, but you know, Nobody knows everything, so um, I've learned that uh, I, had, I had heard about this thing called death grip. So I mean, after uh, after some time, I realized that uh, uh, he was dead after the first shot. And then uh, I tried to get out of there. Uh, I let go of the let go of the two by four that I was holding on to, and I just. Uh, tried to get out the way I had come in. Uh, he was uh, just still holding on to my leg. So I dragged him a couple of feet and I was yelling at him to let go So uh, and yelling at him that I wasn't calling the sheriffs or anything. And uh, then uh, I decided to go out the other door that was in the in the barn there that went into my pig pen uh, because uh, it was closer. So I uh, I stepped over Steve and when I stepped over him to get out the other door, he let go. I went out the other door, but I didn't even think about it, but I didn't, didn't close the door. I was just trying to get away from him. So uh, uh, I managed to get out the uh, side door on the barn. And then I went out the, uh, the gate leads to the front part of the barn. I went out that gate and I came around and went in my little room and I uh, uh, barricaded the door so Steve couldn't get in. I went ahead and cleaned myself up. I had uh, blood on, the, on my back from where I had been pushed into the plumbing. And then uh, I just waited there cleaning myself up a little bit I think it was an hour, an hour and a half. I, didn't, I don't know how long it was. But uh, I yelled at, for Steve and I didn't hear any answer. So I thought he had left. And then uh, I went went out and uh, I went into where the, uh, where we had, where we had the fight. And uh, he was just laying there and my pigs were licking uh, him. And, uh, I went ahead and tried to shoo them out. 
and I get one of them out, and then uh, I get a second one out. While I'm trying to get the third one out, the first two would come back in. I was just really in a lot of pain, having a hard time just standing up. So I figured they would just leave him alone after a while. I'd come back after a couple hours. And uh, uh, I went and laid down and tried to clean myself up again a little bit more. Then I went back to uh, try to figure out what I was going to do with Steve. And uh, my pigs had dragged him outside. So there wasn't anything I could do then. I figured I would just wait until the morning. I got up extra early the next morning and I went out. They had been eating on him. The next day, I mean, I had tried to, I tried to get uh, Steve away from them, but that was no use. I mean, my, my pigs, they, they all weighed three and 400 pounds. And my uh, big boar, I killed him a few months later. He weighed 940 pounds. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I mean, pigs, uh, I, I never I never went anywhere in the pig pen without a, uh, a broom handle. That's what I usually had. Mm-hmm. And uh, you can take a broom, little broom handle or just the back of your hand, and if you hit a pig on the end of its nose, it'll back up. They, they mm-hmm. don't like the back of, they, they don't like their nose being hit. But you can take a you can take a piece of uh, you know you can take a, a bunch of bananas and throw them underneath a the Volkswagen, and they will take the top of their nose and they will lift that Volkswagen up and turn it over to get to those bananas. Oh wow! Yeah, they're powerful yeah. animals, huh? Yeah, uh, but and you can take a um, you can take a two by four. And you can bust it over their heads, and they just kind of look at you. Oh, did you do something to me? I didn't feel anything. <laughs> mm-hmm. The next day, I took my my backhoe and I put my backhoe over next close to the fence, and I dug a hole. And then uh, uh, I went into the, I put the I put the, the, the backhoe bucket into the over the fence, and I went into the. Uh, went into the pig pen and I managed to get Steve into the bucket so I could lift him over the fence. And then uh, then I went ahead and, uh, and I buried Steve. I just uh, I just put him down in the uh, in the grave and then I uh, I, I took a, a, a shovel and I shoveled some dirt on top of him and uh, that was all I could do for the day. But while I was uh, while I was doing that one of my workers came by and saw me burying Steve. He called the sheriff's department. The, the, the next day, Detective Arnold and Sergeant Sickler came out in the evening. I went ahead and I told them, uh, or they, they, they asked me, you know, some questions and stuff. And I guess I just wasn't specific enough. But I told them that I would go ahead and get a couple of shovels and dig them up. They just walked away. My, you know, my, my friend uh, told him that, you know, he saw me burying Steve and, you know, I was going to dig him up. It was, you know, there was no way it was anything but self-defense. And I had a chest that was black and blue to, to prove it. And they walked away. And then I was having terrible nightmares over the next uh, five or six months. So. The nightmares kind of went away, but I didn't realize that, uh, also I didn't realize this at the time, but I had developed uh, PTSD. Uh, a good friend of mine told me that's, that's what I had. And I've been talking to the psychologists and the counselors in, here in prison, and uh, they say that, you know, that I have PTSD and that's been Oh gosh, it's been 10 years now since I was forced to kill Steve, but I'm still having nightmares every once in a while with them beating the crap out of me. Yeah, that's kind of pretty much it for Steve, I guess. And then um, then my nightmares, you know, had pretty much gone away. And this was like a year and a half later. One of the guys that did a little bit of work for me, but uh, he was uh, staying on my property. 
This was Robert Caney. He was a nice enough guy. He drank too, but he was a uh, he was a bench drinker. I think mostly uh, he was a bench drinker because his uh, daughter got raped, and he was really uh, uh, upset about that a couple times a month, and he he'd get fall down drunk. So one day uh, he uh, he gave me twenty dollars. He said he was gonna. Uh, go to work. I, I was thinking that he was going to go to work in Ashland. I don't know exactly where he went, but I was thinking it was working in Ashland. He had, uh, he had asked me one time to come look at the job that he was working on because he wanted my engineering skills to uh, design a, uh, a beam to hold up the floor in this house that he was, or uh, not a house, but a, well, a business that he was working on in the basement. Uh, I never did that, but anyway, that's where I thought he might have been working. So, uh, uh, I took care of his dog for a couple of weeks, and all of a sudden it turned into a couple of months, and I didn't know what the heck was going on. And then uh, his, uh, his son called me and said he thought his father was dead, and he wanted me to report him missing. Uh, so, well, you know, I... He is missing as far as I'm concerned, I guess, but, uh, you know, that that's, should be your responsibility to do that. About a week or a week and a half later, I went down to uh, take care of my pigs in the morning. And my pigs, uh, pigs are a lot smarter than dogs. If you go outside and you have a dog and the dog comes right up to you, to get his food. My pigs, they knew in the back of the barn is where they got fed. So when they see me coming down to the barn, they would immediately go around to the back of the barn and they would sit there waiting for me to feed them. So this morning, they were all standing around and uh, in the in the middle of the uh, middle of the pig pen, and I didn't understand what they were doing. I didn't, didn't understand why they didn't go back to where I was going to feed them. So I walked walked into the uh, walked in the pig pen, and there I saw Robert. He was just uh, laying there on his back, and his guts were gone, and his intestines were uh, out on the uh, out on the ground. And then I I heard this little moan, and I couldn't believe that he was still alive. Another thing that I learned was that bodies, um, you could be dead for hours and still make noises. So anyway, I, I tried to chew the pigs off, but they didn't, they wouldn't go. And then uh, when I heard that little moan, I couldn't believe that he was still alive. So when I went up and I got my, uh, my rifle and I came back down, and, uh, I shot him to, to put him out of his misery. Like I said, I didn't want I, I didn't want Robert's family to know the horrible way that he died. And his son had called me and said he thought his father was dead. So I figured that. Uh, well, another another stupid part on myself. I went ahead. And I didn't say anything because I didn't want his family to know, know how he died. It turned out that a, a day or two later, a coyote had gotten in there and actually dragged off one of his legs. I managed to, uh, uh, I managed to get Robert uh, out of the pig pen, what was left of him. And they, they had pulled him apart more than anything else by then. So uh, I was able to uh, grab the bits and pieces of him. I <laughs> hate to say it like that, but um, I managed to get, uh, I managed to get Robert picked up and put in uh, some plastic bags. I honestly don't know what I was going to do with his body. Steve was a good friend and everything for years, and um, I wanted him buried, you know, uh, on my property where uh, where he spent, you know, a lot of time helping me to really make it look nice. Robert was, uh, he was a pretty good worker. He didn't like to work a lot, but when he uh, when he did work, he was uh, he was a good worker. He was very uh, uh, what do I want to say? Very um, tr- uh, uh, no, I don't, don't want to say truthful. He was uh, honest. He was uh, Ro- uh, Robert was very honest. 
I was uh, charging him some rent, and he uh, he came up. He didn't have rent money, and I tried to get him to do some work for his rent. And he, uh, like I say, he was kind of lazy in that respect. So he went ahead and he gave me some stuff in exchange for rent, which I really didn't want. But I figured later, you know, he would uh, find some money and you know, get his uh, get his stuff back. Steve and uh, Steve and Robert were two different people. Steve, I couldn't give him anything to to do unless it was very menial. Because um, one day he was working up the street for a friend of mine that was uh, chopping wood for uh, uh, to sell his firewood, and he nearly cut his hand off on a log splitter, so he got fired from that job. And when he was working for me. I gave him a little bow saw to cut things with, and I had him go out on my property and cut the lower limbs off of trees. So, Susan, last week I was telling you about a word by the name of murder bilia. Um, you know, it's like a, a, a hobby in which people collect things from convicted murderers, you know, infamous criminals, and so on and so forth. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I remember that. What are, what is what are your thoughts on people collecting things from say people like yourself just because you you're convicted of a, a heinous crime like wanting to buy a, a letter or a oh, piece I of your I hair told you or about that. yeah um, yeah I, I I think these people are crazy <laughs> I don't know what else to say I had uh, I had one guy write me a few weeks ago and uh, he would ask me a half a dozen questions on the, in the letter and. Uh, one of the questions was, you know, um, have you ever had any strange uh, requests from other people that have wrote in? And I thought, well, this was the strangest one of yet. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, um, I don't watch these uh, uh, reality shows because I don't think there's any reality to them. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, yeah. People, uh, I mean, yeah, uh, I mean, you look me up on the internet, and God, if I, if, um, if, if I was anything, you know, like what they make me out to be, I would not want anything to do with me at all. And, you know, people are calling, you know, uh, right at me and trying to find out things about me and stuff. I, I don't understand it. Um, something that I find interesting to hear from people is that a lot of people feel that there's value to uh, uh, like a true crime book to be written on a case or, or a TV show. Um, but I feel like the, uh, somebody writes a book or makes a TV show that a lot of people will, will stand behind that and be like, yes, this is, this is informative and important and a good way, yeah. to, a good way to spend money. However, if they were buying artwork or letters or, you know, these physical collectibles from people, that somehow becomes a, a, a bit of a moral gray area, right? So I'm curious if you think that, let's say if somebody were to write a book, a book about you, and even well, if they were, you were involved with it, sorry, go ahead. If, if, a, if it was a book telling the truth, like I just t- told you 90% of, I, you know, I would, mm-hmm. I would not be against that. Yeah. But um, uh, I watched a couple episodes of that snap that had me on there, and that was like 90% lies. I had uh, uh, a British uh, uh, television uh, show or something. Uh, they sent me a, uh, a letter to fill out, and uh, I sent that back to them saying that I would uh, talk to them. But, uh, I haven't heard any uh, anything back from them yet. So, you, so you kind of feel if somebody's telling the um, the true story, or uh, I guess in some circumstances, the story from the perspective of the person involved, whoever that might be, who's incarcerated, yeah, then it's justified. In then uh, you know, if somebody was writing a book on that, then them making a profit on that would be positive because they're kind of getting. Um, the, the serious point across. Well, that's, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't, uh, um, I don't watch 
Chucky. Mm-hmm. Uh, stupid doll, <laughs> you know, and I don't watch uh, uh, the, the Walking Dead. Uh, I think the stupid programs. Uh, okay. I, I'm in my little room here changing the channels and I come across that snap thing. And I immediately go to another channel. The only reason I ever watched it was that uh, one of the girls in here said they saw me on it. So the next day I went ahead and uh, uh, I kept going back and forth until I, uh, I got to the program where they had me on there. And mm-hmm. I watched it and said, my gosh, this is, you know, just a you know, total bunch of lies. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I wrote them, and uh, uh, they never sent, sent anything back or, you know, asked me any questions, and I, I told them in the, in the letter that if they did not get back in touch with me and continue to uh, broadcast those lies, I was going to sue them for $100 million for... Uh, uh, nas- uh, what did I, what I say? Na- na- nationwide defamation of character. <laughs> I think that's mm-hmm. what the words I used. Uh, so so uh, it kind of sounds like you feel like if um, if somebody was getting your honest and true story across, and that would be a positive thing, and you would not have an issue with them, um, you know, maybe profiting off of that, assuming they're doing something that could be helpful to you, right? Um, uh, yes. Um, I guess at this point I should be asking you, Taylor, is that something you're planning on doing? Well, no, I'm just planning on, I just wanted to get to know you and, and um, talk with you and Andrew because I feel like Andrew has a really good perspective on the prison system, um, on inmates, and I think that he, better than a lot of people, is kind of getting the direct and unfiltered story out, you know? Which yeah. is his podcast and his work that he's doing. He's just letting people talk and he's not necessarily criticizing that or giving his opinions. He's not telling the story. He's just having people tell their own stories, right? Right. Well, yeah, you know, I mean, I, uh, I have, I, I can't listen to what he's already put out there, but I, I know that what I've said is to, to him has been the truth. Yeah. Uh, uh, a couple other things that, uh, I mean, uh, I don't know if I mentioned it before or not, but my lawyer, they, when, when they were searching my property, uh, they found a four-year-old shotgun shell in my pig pen. And the detective... Uh, Henderson, he decided that because he found a shotgun shell, even though it was four years old, he would. He told the uh, uh, district attorney that I shot Rob with a shotgun, and that was total bullshit. I shot him in the head with a twenty-two, and then my lawyer, uh, because I told her that I shot him in the head to put him out of his misery, uh, she decided that. Uh, it was, ir- ir- in her own words, she said it was irrelevant how he died, uh, that, uh, you know, that I had, I had killed a man and she didn't care. This was my lawyer trying to, um, that was supposed to be defending me. And then they had, uh, uh, they, they found, a, well, actually they found two shotguns in a, in a pawn shop under my name. One of the uh, one of the guys that worked for me, uh, Sean Lomanis, uh, he went to my attorney, told her, uh, him and his wife, uh, Kathy, Kathy Clawson, the, the two of them told my lawyer that it was his shotgun and that he had forged my signature. My lawyer knew the evidence was a bunch of bullshit, and she did nothing. And then, uh, uh, while I was being interrogated, they were asking me a bunch of questions, and they asked me if I felt bad about anything. This was like this was a year and a half after I had killed Robert, and uh, I had uh, 
uh, you know, my uh, my nightmares had gone completely by this time. The PTSD, I, uh, it's kind of a weird thing, but I don't know, I don't know how it works. But anyway, my mind had completely blotted that out, so that I could, so that I could sleep. And now, ten years later, because I was forced to remember it, I'm still having nightmares again. There, you know, most of them are not very bad, but some of them are. If I, you know, if I go to bed kind of in a bad attitude or something, I'll have a bad nightmare, of, you know, of being beaten half to death. Yeah, I can imagine that that'll um, be tough. And then uh, they were asking me questions about Robert. And I was telling them that, uh, you know, I had, uh, I went down to the pig pen and I found his body. And uh, he was completely disemboweled. I didn't think he was alive. And I told him, I, you know, I was thinking about just putting him out of his misery. And then they started asking me questions of if uh, I, had, uh, I had shot him with a shotgun. And... Uh, that uh, he had attacked me. I said, no, he, he did not attack me. You know, he was, a, he was a nice guy. He was, you know, he didn't, he, uh, he didn't attack me at all. I just went down and I found his body in the pig pen. He was all disemboweled. And uh, I heard this little noise and I thought he, you know, for the next, you know, minute and a half might be alive and then, you know, uh, so I shot him to put him out of his misery, and I didn't want, to, you know, I didn't want his family to learn how he had died. So that's why I never said anything. But then, the, when I refused to lie and say that Robert attacked me, that's when they went ahead and charged me with murder. Here's, uh, here's these cops trying to get me to perjure myself, and when I refused, they charged me with murder. <laughs> I just don't understand this legal system at all, I'm sorry. Uh, so let me ask you something, and it's um, not directly relevant, but I guess it's relevant to the whole conversation, uh, uh, the conversation entirely, but uh, let, let's say, do you think that um, you should be allowed the right to make money while you're in prison? Uh, uh, let's say if you're trying to make money, raise money to cover legal fees or to just, you know, get some uh, comforts from commissary. Uh, do you think that you should be able to be able to uh, create artwork or sell maybe like a hand trace in oh, a letter? Uh, and, yeah. Or do you um, think that that should just be irrelevant for anybody and that nobody should be allowed to, to uh, do I, that? I think it's kind of irrelevant, but um, okay. I have been uh, I have been writing a little book that mm. I was thinking about getting made into a movie or something actually, but. Mm. I have been having trouble trying to, um, uh, I've got about 40 pages of it, but I can't get to the uh, computer, you know, to uh, get it all typed up nice. I'm, I'm still having a hard time doing that. Uh, one thing one, one thing I would like to do, it's, it's not really to make money, but I mean, it, uh, uh, not, not really make money for myself, but, uh, uh, I would like to start a raffle, and if anybody sends me five dollars, I will keep their name and, uh, and you know information. And if somebody can find my brother, his name is James Buchan. Uh, he was raised in Richmond, California. He is sixty-nine years old. And um, if anybody out there can find my brother, um, I will guarantee $500 plus all the $5 listeners out there, they all send me $5. Whoever finds my brother and has my brother get in touch with me with their name. They will, uh, they will get whatever there is out there, and I will, I will guarantee at least five hundred dollars. I'm, I'm, I'm really trying to find my brother. Uh, I think if I can get a hold of him, 
he can uh, he can help me. When's when's the last time you were in touch with your brother uh, Susan? Uh, 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 I haven't been able to get a hold of him in thirty years. He was a uh, uh, I I joined the Navy and uh, he joined the Air Force. And the last time I talked to him, he was in um, Rapid City, South Dakota, in the Air Force. And uh, the next time I tried to call him, he wasn't there. And uh, the military said that uh, they would not tell me where he was unless I needed a kidney. Every once in a while I would call just about every city in California. And uh, a couple of times I, uh, I got a hold of uh, people that were named James Buchan, but they were not my brother. So I know he is out there somewhere. He was raised in Richmond, California, went to Richmond Union High School. And uh, he's somewhere out there. I know he's 69 years old. I don't know if he the exact birth date. But uh, he's out there somewhere. And uh, whoever, can, whoever can find my brother, uh, I will guarantee them at least $500. We might have more resources to be able to do that so we can try and look into that because obviously yeah. we have a little more freedom of internet access uh, uh, and that seems to be an easy way to track people down these days. So. Well, I've had a, several people, I, one of them said they found 1,700 people in James Buchanan in the United States. Mm -hmm. So that was why I came up with this idea. Um, just a couple of weeks ago and uh, I thought that you know all your listeners out there uh, they may everybody gets out there maybe they'll find him or maybe mm -hmm. you know he's next door to one of them yeah how do you feel when it comes to um, you know like we talked about true crime collectibles about say somebody buying and selling a letter you wrote or like a hand tracing you wrote like almost like comparing it to basketball cards or baseball cards kind of trading i guess murderers alike like how do you how does that you know feel to you being that you're in a prison with other people that are convicted of you know similar crimes and whatnot uh, yeah no like i say uh, uh, i mean i would like to have willie may's baseball um, but uh, um, I think that people, I, I mean, I, 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 I guess uh, some of your listeners are the same way too, too but I don't, uh, I, I really don't want to say anything bad about them, but um, it, uh, this one friend of mine, she told me, some of the stuff that was on the internet about me and uh, uh, the, the only thing I could think of is sick <laughs> Any, anybody that wants to become my friend and uh, uh, you know I mean I, I, I'd love to be you know uh, I'd love to make friends with you and, and uh, a tailor but uh, if, if the two of you you know want to make friends with me just because I'm uh, uh, in here, uh, you know, accused of being a mass murderer, feeding people the pigs, you know, uh, I think that's sick. I don't know what else to call it. Yeah, I think that um, in more recent history, true crime has kind of faded into the world of pop culture and vice versa. And I think that's well, that, cool. uh, there's, there's, you know, I mean, there's true, true crimes is, you know, learning the truth about a crime. Mm -hmm. Being, you know, being, uh, uh, being accused of something does not make it true. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that, I, I personally think that that's why uh, some of the stuff that Andrew does is very positive because he get the stories that people aren't writing about. You know, journalists want to have the sensation. They don't want to have the, they don't want to have necessarily the truth, but they want the sensationalized side of it. Yeah, all this, you know, uh, uh, these uh, uh, true, true crimes and reality shows on te 
television. Um, there's nothing real about them. You know, um, you know, you're, you're driving down the freeway and everybody wants to slow down and look at an accident. And I, you know, I admit I don't slow down on purpose, but if the car in front of me is, you know, doing 10 miles an hour, I'm going to look over at the accident myself. But uh, I'm not I'm not looking over there to see a, a leg in one place and a, uh, an arm over in another place and the body in the third place. Mm-hmm. Uh, I went ahead and uh, uh, I, uh, I wanted to defend myself from the very beginning. I told the judge that I did not like the lawyer I had. And uh, he had me see a psychiatrist. The psychi- when I got the psychiatrist report, the judge said that I was smarter than he thought I was and granted me permission to defend myself. But then he made me keep this other lawyer who I hated. And uh, when, uh, uh, when she was deposed, she admitted you know, that she made what she called a strategic decision to allow false evidence into court. And uh, I don't understand how people can do that. And then uh, my attorney also said while she was under uh, under oath that uh, the, uh, the lead detective, uh, Henderson, she said that uh, her... Uh, assistant, uh, Garen, uh, Garen Pitamonte, she told me, uh, she told him under oath that Garen, uh, that Detective Henderson told Pitamonte that he knew that the signature on this uh, uh, pawn slip was not mine, and that would have proved, you know, the, uh, the whole thing was a bunch of, but she left that into court also. When, you know, she, she was, she was told it was bullshit by the guy that owned the shotgun. I don't know. There's just so much stuff going around and it's all lies. Well, I, I appreciate you sharing your, your side of that because obviously the only information that I could know about you uh, having not that before is what I read online. So it's, it's definitely good yeah. to be able to talk to you and, and, and hear back from you uh, what your your side of all the events. Yeah. Uh, I, could, um, I, I, I don't know. It's just, um, it, it, I mean, I'm, I'm waiting in here for years and years, and I finally get to uh, send some paperwork to the Oregon Supreme Court, and uh, the, the lawyers that I had, they, they told me that they can't introduce uh, new evidence. And I'm saying, this isn't new evidence, it's evidence that my first lawyer did not bring up to, in court. And they say they can't bring it up. So I finally get to say it to the Oregon Supreme Court in my own pro se brief, which was three pages long, and not, you know, uh, and not 36 pages or whatever. And, uh, I said very plainly, Steve beat the crap out of me and nearly killed me, and I did kill him. Mm -hmm. But I was beaten so badly that, you know, he busted my right implant. That surgery cost me $8,914. I I don't know how I can end up with a hospital bill of almost $9,000 and then be charged with murder. This is... You know, it, it's just insane. Before we wrap this phone call up, is there is there anything that you want to end with? Um, not really. Well, I think you give a good uh, perspective of how you feel about it. So I, I, I really appreciate you talking about that because it can be a bit of a sensitive subject for people who uh, aren't necessarily involved in that, let alone somebody who may have a personal connection to it. Um. Yeah, no, like I said, I, I might like 
Willie Mays baseball or something, but mm-hmm. other than that, um, um, you know, I don't, I, I don't, I don't think I would want to um, mm-hmm. sign a piece of paper with my name on it and have it um, related to the crime I'm supposed to have done. Um, when I do get out of here, one of the things I want to do is you know, get the money that's owed me for my false imprisonment. And um, I've always wanted to do, do something for the uh, uh, fire department out in Weimar. I was planning on, when I, when I first got in here, you know, Jesus, seven years ago, um, I was planning on giving them quite a bit of money to uh, pay for the parking lot. At the, at the Weimar Fire Department so they could have uh, uh, yard sales out there more often and not being in the mud. And then uh, uh, after I figured out that I was getting so much money and then I wouldn't be able to sue these people for... Uh, One minute remaining. Uh, my, my plan was to... Uh, uh, the. Uh, Rogue River High School, I was going to go ahead and uh, cover the roof with solar panels and buy a couple of buses that ran on electricity. So that's what I plan on doing with my money when I get out of here. Uh Well, it's good to know. I appreciate you uh, sharing that. Uh, 